three, two, one, and hey everybody, what's up? Oh, let me go live here on my Instagram because that's how we get down. You hear my voice, but you see my guest on today. This is, oh, there I am uh, behind him. What's up? Uh, it's Kimbro. We're in the Pod Brother Studios, and uh, I got one of my dear friends I met uh, about three or four years ago um, in Hollywood down at the Pig and Whistle. He was doing his thing, and we got to talking about comedy and industry and concerts. I was on tour doing concerts, and he was one of the pioneers of developing concerts here in Hollywood, and one thing led to another, and we got to talking about softball, and next thing you know, I'm out there on the field with him playing <laughs> softball. Now, when we first talked, um, it was uh, Gary Marshall was still alive, and uh, but I had to get hip hip surgery, so I wasn't able to go out and play. By the time I got hip and rehabilitated and got my my game back, uh, Gary Marshall had already left us to the big softball diamond in the sky. So I I missed that experience. But hanging out with Mike has uh, made up for the difference of that. Mike, he and Greg, how you doing, my man? Oh, uh, very good, Steve. Thank you. you. You know, I know you're a very busy man, and I want to thank you for taking some time out to stop by the Pod Brother Studios and uh, uh, give me a little quality time here so we can chop it up. Hey, not a problem, man. Um, so take, let's go way, way, way back to the very, 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 very beginning when you were like a kid. Did you, did you think that you would be in the music industry and being like a Hollywood iconic uh, yeah, you know, music dude, or 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 were you thinking, you know, maybe you can make pizzas for a living? Huh? Both. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I was going to be in the music business, but I did. Uh, I mean, my first show. I was five years old when I went to my first show, which was Chubby Checker, The Drifters, Little Anthony and the Imperials, Little Brenda Lee, uh, The Coasters, uh, at the Murray the K Swing and Soiree at the Brooklyn RKO Paramount. And I did, not realizing it at the moment, but there was an infinity with me and music, which I believe started there. But when I was in high school, I made pizza, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was uh, the early years of making pizza. You still could make a pretty good pizza out here, huh? Uh, probably, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, rumor has it. <laughs> um, now, did you play uh, baseball back in the day or, you know, street ball, stick ball? What was your, uh, well, were you like a walking baseball almanac? Uh, who, who who was your team, the, the Yankees or Yankees. the Mets? No, no, the Yankees. Yeah, there, no. there are me no too. Mets. Yeah, me too, yeah. <laughs> Well, I started playing, you know, we played stickball, and I grew up in Ozone Park in, in New York City, and we played stickball, you know, from cover to cover and off the wall, played things like that. Then in my high school years, I moved out to Long Island, and that's when we started playing on grass. And we played every day, yeah. every day, until later on in the high school years, which then was more music. And I left the ball behind, but then throughout the years, I always went back and played. And uh, stickball in New York is is as big as any other sport, basically. Probably. Probably. <laughs> stickball, I, handball, slap yeah, ball, punch I, ball. I played a little stickball when I lived in in, yeah. uh, in New York. I was in a, I'm, a, I'm one of them Bronx boys. Oh yeah. And uh, I lived on Walton Avenue. I was like three blocks from Yankee Stadium. Okay. So I uh, yeah. and and when I lived in New York, uh, Roger Clemens was playing. What's up, uh, Roger? Um, and you know, I met him in Boston. We used to hang out, and then when he, I moved to New York, he got traded to New York right at the same time. Uh -huh. And then he would hook me up with like you know home plate tickets with the wives and the girlfriends, and and then there I am in the middle of it all. It was it was super great experience. I'll imagine, yeah, man, it was great. I mean, I was more in the you know Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris era. Clem, I was already in California when when Clemens came to the Yankees, but. Um, you know, I always had friends in baseball. I, mean, I Tim Flannery, Bruce Bochy. I used to do sound for Tim's band all the time in San Diego. I had him play the Whiskey, the Roxy, all over L.A. We used to hang out at spring training. So I, I, I've always had an affinity with baseball and, as, and music. Now, how was your, what was, how did the transition from New York to California happen with you getting involved in the music? Were you already involved with music here in New York? You, you really want to know this story? I want to know this story, yeah. Okay. So back in the day, when I was involved with marijuana, good old marijuana, living in the East Village, <laughs> uh, I had a partner, and me and him would, you know, we'd do our little 
selling dime bags and quarter, you know, pot bags. You know, nothing, you know no the street hustle. Drugs. You had yeah. the street hustle going. Yeah, you know, we lived down the street from the Fillmore East, Bill Grange Fillmore East. We would go to all the concerts there and hang out and get stoned and party and stuff. But over the course of time, he went his way, I went my way. And eventually, one day, a friend of mine came and said, you know, Ray's at the Chelsea Hotel. He's got some really good pot. I said, oh, I haven't seen Ray in a long time. Let's go get some pot. So we walk in, and Ray is sweating and nervous and jittery and look a little yellow. And it's like, what the hell is wrong with you, man? <laughs> and he takes out a thirty-eight and points it at me, and he says, I'm strung out. That's what's wrong. And I need money. It's Whoa. Like, I said, you got to be kidding. He said, no, if I have to, I'm going to shoot you in the leg. Give me your money. So I threw my wallet out. He took almost all of it. And he told my friend, he had tied his hands behind his back. So they ran out. He said, now you come with me to my friend. And he had the gun on him. And they went out the door. I untied myself, went running around looking for him, couldn't find him. What we did, though, as a main uh, pastime, then we played a lot of handball and basketball. So we're down at the handball courts playing, and a friend of mine comes up. He says, hey, I found Ray. And I put the word out. I'm looking for him. I'm going to get him. I'm going to kill him. I can't believe he did this. I said, where is he? And they said, quick, come in. Come to the car. So I went to the car, turned on the radio. Ray, looking for money to get out of town. The day that the movie, Dog Day Afternoon, came out. Oh, yeah. He got, you know? Yeah, he got an idea. He went into a bank on Fifth Avenue got caught inside the bank, took 10 people hostage, called up WNEWFM, Scott Muni show, and said, start playing Dead Dylan or the Stones or I'm throwing bodies out. What? No lie. So what wow. Wow. So they interviewed him, and, uh, you know, Scott Muni said, well, what are you doing this for? He says, well, you know, I kind of ripped this cat off, and, this cat's after me, and I figured I better get some money and get out of town. And this guy said, well, who are you? He said, no, I'm just another cat. We're all cats in this game. So eventually he fell asleep, and, you know, they got him, put him to prison. But while he was in there, he previewed a Grateful Dead album, which had just come out that day as well, called Blues for Allah. The writer of most of, of Garcia's partner, a guy by the name of Robert Hunter, heard about it. And he wrote a song called Cats Under the Stars about this experience, which then Jerry Garcia liked it. And he uh, wrote a song about it, and it became an album, Cats Under the Stars. So my infinity to music was getting closer and closer all the time. Uh, then I moved out. I said, well, you know what? i got to get out of town. I just can't stay here because there's going to be some young buck detective wanting to know who the other cat was. You know, so, so you I, went on the lamb. I, I didn't go on the lamb, but I, I kind of hightailed it out of town. Went to the Badlands in New Mexico. I had a lady friend down there who wanted me to move in with her, so I took her up on it. And after a year of going crazy in New Mexico, I said, well, I either go back to New York or I go west. I tried west, and eventually I wound up in, in L.A., and I was doing I, – I took all my energy from all the drug days and the gang mm -hmm. days in New York and all that – and converted it into let's do good. And I put I set up this program in L.A. where we would work with small farmers, grabbing food from small farmers, bringing it to inner city people, seniors, kids, alcoholic drug recovery programs. I had this amazing free food network, probably the largest in the United States at that time. And I met somebody who wanted me to help them cater an event, which was Survival Sunday at Hollywood Bowl. And I went, and I helped them get all the food, and I wound up doing that for a few years, and then uh, got in really good with all these people that were doing all these benefit concerts. We wound up producing uh, uh, Peace Sunday, which was the largest benefit concert ever at, at the Rose Bowl. And How many people? 90,000. Oh, wow. In one place. So they, they've had benefit concerts, uh, Live Aid, but there was never... 90,000 in one place. They were, you know, 40,000 mm -hmm. here, 20,000. Mm -hmm. This was the largest single gathering benefit concert ever. And then from there, it was a band called The Untouchables, which asked me to uh, come out on the road with them. And eventually, I became their tour manager. Uh, this was 1984. 
and I never looked back. I just got into music then. Since then, um, I've booked 50 clubs. I've booked uh, 30, over 33,000 performances here in the Los Angeles area, a little bit in Sacramento. And uh, it's been going full tilt ever since. Wow, bro. that's that's awesome, man. That's you know that's a great story. You know you you probably should do your own uh, documentary on you know some of like your chapters because I I know you probably got a lot of, a lot of stories just like that that have like intensity and left curves and and uh, you know a little bit on the dark side. Oh, probably, but, yeah. But, but mm-hmm. you know, it's it's good that you were able to have uh, the street savvy and the wisdom and the critical thinking to survive it and become someone who's doing good things. Yeah, I mean, I was. It got to a point where it's just like, well, what am I going to do here? I'm out. When I finally went up, to, I was in San Francisco. Um, I went from Santa Cruz to San Francisco. I didn't know anybody. Just drove up, and. I, I was living in my van for a little while. I was down to 56 cents, and I applied for a job at a pizza place, believe it or not. Two old Italian guys, two brothers, and they said, we don't, make, we don't use a machine to make the pizza. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, you know, we, we don't roll the, the dough on a machine. I said, I, I never heard of such a thing. <laughs> you like do, you like <laughs> do it by hand, tossing it up. He gave me the pizza, and I did the whole toss, toss it up in the air and stuff. And he said, okay, you're hired. I said, when can I start? He said, tomorrow. <laughs> I parked a van around the block, spent 56 cents on a candy bar, had some apples that I picked, went to the gas station to wash up, went back the next day. I kept stealing all the, the food out of the little joints, the pe- pieces of pepperoni and sausage and stuff. I mean, they knew. They saw that I was hungry and stuff. And uh, so I was up there for about three years, and that's when I, that's up there, something just happened up in the Bay Area where I just said, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take this energy and see what happens if I just channel it all to like doing good. Always do good. Make sure something good happens. You're helping somebody and you're doing a good thing. And I got a job with a company and it was job training problem kids. And then when I went to open up my paycheck after two weeks, I noticed there was a lot more money. I said, you made a mistake. You overpaid me. They said, no, 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 no. We wanted to give you more. You did a great job. I said, okay. And then two weeks after that was the same thing, even more money. And I said, I think you made a mistake again. And they said, no, no, no. <laughs> Little did I know they had other plans for me. And they said, hey, you know, we need someone to go to Los Angeles. I, it's like, it's not me. I ain't going to L.A. No way. They like, too late. We already paid you, so yeah. you got to go. No, they they flew me down. They said, "This is what you'll do. You'll you know you'll this is your office. This is you know you'll be in charge of all this stuff." And I said, "Okay." And it was that street savvy that helped me get all you know the free food donations to work with the farmers to keep the trucks rolling, to go into the inner cities, and it was when I converted that you know that street energy into doing those good things, mm-hmm. and that's when it took off. That's when I met the people that wanted me to work with them on the on the rallies and the. The, the, the you know the no nukes concerts and the stop the bombs and all that kind of stuff and it just uh, escalated from there and that's when it was just it all became clear you know I was feeding people I was feeding their stomachs feeding their bodies all of a sudden I was feeding their souls but not in a religious kind of way but more like in a musical spiritual way sure and I just kept that going and the more I can make people happy the musicians the audience the club owners you know it was like positive energy just like flowing everywhere so that kind of took you into the woodstock thing tell us how you got involved in woodstock oh uh well i wasn't too involved in the first woodstock which was because i was waiting for a shipment to come in so i had to be around (laughs) you were still a cat back then yeah working the streets yeah oh yeah (laughs) but we went back i got a bunch of people we all flew back for the 25 year anniversary that Woodstock and that was that was really interesting we just kind of there was a a truck there parked on the pathway between the two stages a UPS truck and uh, a guy needed help so we uh, went in there and said well we'll help you out I had brought the the bouncer from the Whiskey A Go-Go the manager from the Whiskey A Go-Go my 12 year old cousin and some other guy and we just were helping him out keeping people off the truck and we noticed all these boxes of candy and gum in the truck. And I said, what's this? And, you know, we said, well, I was supposed to 
give this to some alcoholic recovery program and they were going to give it out to people. But I don't know where they are. So people wanted to climb on the truck, but we climbed on top of the truck and we would rent space out. It's like, you want to climb up on top of the truck? You know, it cost you a beer. It cost you, you know, a joint. It cost you something. <laughs> and the girls who didn't have anything said, well, you got to dance topless for us on top of the truck. Dope. And then we would take the, the candy and the ice and the gum and we throw it out to the crowd. And just from this truck alone, we had an audience of 10,000 people. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, and then, we, you know, I managed to get all access passes and we just did anything. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. We did whatever somebody handed us, we did. We went wherever we wanted. It, it, amazing. I, I can't wait for the next one. Now, my friend Alex is with Sweetwater, and he's really involved with this, this next Woodstock. So I don't, I'm not sure how, but we'll be involved one way. I just found Sly Stone for someone that's writing mm -hmm. a book. So there's going to be another like Woodstock kind of reunion kind of oh, thing? Oh, yeah, this year. This is the 50-year anniversary. And where's it going to be? Well, there's going to be two. Michael Lang, who did the original, wants to do a big, giant festival in Watkins Glen, which is holds the record for the largest benefit, not benefit, largest concert ever. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, and that was, I think, the Dead, the Band, and the Allman Brothers. And the people that have the new uh, Woodstock, uh, they built a uh, indoor-outdoor uh, place at the site where the original Woodstock was. Mm -hmm. So now they're competing for acts right now, and we're not really sure. They're both doing something. But we're not sure which one we're going to go to. I know Alex is flying to New York in a couple of weeks to go to the site at Bethel, and they, they're going to, it's an opening ceremony for the year, it's they, I guess for their outdoor stuff. So they're going to, they're going to be talking about the original Woodstock and stuff there. So when he gets nice. back, we'll probably figure out what we're going to do. Well, I see we have a couple people that have joined us live. Uh, oh, cool. we, we have uh, Jamie from Michigan. If you have any questions for uh, for Mike. Oh, uh, Jamie. Uh, Mike says, hi, uh, my old uh, cruise ship buddy, John Lee, who's in Orlando, who's a, a very accomplished musician himself. Uh, he got me on the Crystal Harmony in 92 for nice. the 92 Olympics in Barcelona. Oh, cool. He was the man. stage manager on that. Nice, nice. Uh, a luxury ship built by um, the, the Japanese, the um, Mitsubishi, owned, mm -hmm. owned those cruises. And he was, so what's up, John? Good to see you. Uh, Jackie Levy is in the house. She says, oh, this hi, is so fun. Thanks for tuning in on us, Jackie. Um, so you are... Um, Doing so much cool stuff. I, I was looking at some of your tapes, and I saw a, a clip where you were doing some insight, kind of tell-all, on a documentary about uh, Linkin Park. Yeah. That band. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like the starter days, like the beginning, beginning days, like the, you know, straight off the Greyhound bus days. You want to hear the story? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm dying to hear that story, man. Because, right. because I was kind of in and out. I had stuff to do. I was working on the studio. I wanted to get mm -hmm. everything set up for the night, so I couldn't watch the whole thing. And I'm dying to watch it. So I'm like, oh man, I got to finish <laughs> setting up the studio. It's like, oh man, this is, this is like really good. But yeah, um, because I was on tour with uh, Godsmack and Our Lady Peace, Three Doors Down, and it was kind of like it wasn't the beginning, the beginning, but they were opening act for major acts. Right. So. Uh, and then they became like, you know, stadium headlining acts. That's so right, I was yeah. right there in that little pocket, uh -huh. but you were there before even that stage. Oh yeah, I was there from the beginning. Yeah, Absolutely. which is which is like really cool. Tell us about that. They were called the pricks. The pricks, yeah, the that's. Pricks. <laughs> I'm sitting, and, in... and it was just kind of a name that they kind of randomly threw just because it's a. Uh, yeah. Just... Well, I was sitting at my desk. I, I was the in-house booker at the Whiskey A Go Go, and I'm sitting at my desk, and I'm. Writing and also I look up and there's these kids and standing in front of me and they were like And I said what could I do for you guys and they threw a cassette on my desk and I picked it up and it said the pricks and I said yes, <laughs> and so we want to play here I said, mm, Okay, well, let me listen to the cassette and you contact me tomorrow and I'll let you know So I went home. I listened to the cassette. It was you know a garage tape that they did in their garage or whatever and it wasn't wasn't that good, um, but I listened to it anyway. I had this theory 
where you know the the Sunset Strip was a lot of pay to play, and I wanted to break away from that. I wanted to get as many people uh, to do not to do pay to play as, if at all possible in any way. So I listened to the tape. It wasn't like I said, it wasn't really that good. But they called the next day, and I said. Um, and when, when were you looking to do a show? When did you want to do a show? And I said, as soon as possible. Now, just before that, a band had canceled a 10 p.m. Wednesday night show the next week. To get somebody to play 10 p.m. on a Wednesday night, yeah, not so easy. Too last minute. Yeah, yeah, too last minute. So I said, how about next Wednesday at 10 p.m.? They said, okay, great. I said, okay. These guys, look, they're gung-ho. I said, can you help me sell some tickets? Do you want to, Do you want to do some tickets? They said, Absolutely, we want to sell tickets. I said, okay, cool. How about 50 tickets? They said, no, no, give us 75. I said, sure. Come in, get 75 <laughs> tickets. you like, all right, you little gung-ho whippersnappers, whatever. I'm figuring, I'm figuring. Now, they didn't have to sell these tickets. It was not, it was not part of the deal. that They wanted to sell the tickets. I'm figuring 75 tickets means 13 people, mother, father, aunt, uncle, you mm -hmm. know. That kind of stuff. They, Relatives of the band. Right. They brought in over 100 <laughs> people on a week's notice. Get out. And they were better than the tape. So I booked them again, and I booked them again. They kept getting better and better. And I, they all be, they, then when they graduated high school, they all went to different colleges. And they all took turns being my interns, at, which was, which was kind of cool. That, but nobody knew they were going to do what they did. Sure. And um, they... You know, it just kept getting better and better. And Brad, the guitar player, was my waiter. I owned a club. I bought my own club down on Melrose. He was the waiter there. He was also my doorman at the Whiskey and the Roxy when I booked there. And uh, I actually put him, I was managing Screech from Saved by the Bell. Get Dustin out Diamond. of here. Was he was he on Saved by the Bell then, or was he like yeah. busted out? Like no, no, a it was of, the was he a freak show by then. No, no, no. It was the the uh, there were two Saved by the Bells, the college years. And then they had to, they kept the original one where Screech became the principal's aide or something like that. He was uh, in the administration part of it. And they had a whole new cast of kids. And he was doing that part. And we used to go hang out at, you know, at the studios at NBC and stuff like that. I actually put Brad from Lincoln Park into a band because Screech didn't want to be Screech. He wanted to be Dustin Diamond. And I, yeah, I remember that. Right, so yeah. I got him a band. I put the together yeah. a band for him we'd, we'd go out we hit all the hot spots and you was know. he trying to sing or play or, or he was i got him the guy by the name of freebo taught him bass i got him to take give him bass lessons so he was starting to play bass kind of trying to sing we weren't there all the way yet uh johnny cash's granddaughter tiffany lowe was my assistant at the time and they got together, and I said to both of them, "I don't think this is a good idea," because <laughs> I knew because Screech had a, he had a room in my house, and he would bring all his you know little girlfriends over and stuff. And I was telling Tiffany, I, "I'm not sure," and she was like, "Well, he knows what it's like to go up in the spotlight, blah blah blah," and of course that didn't work out. Uh, but I did have Brad play with Screech for a while. And that, that band never blossomed, let's put it that way. <laughs> and then the next thing wow, I know... Wow, the turns, the turns we make, yeah. man, and, and who who knew? Yeah, I would put Lincoln Park, they were called, at that time they were called the Zeros, and I put them on with Godsmack, I put them on with System of a Down, Hoobastank. I would... I love System of a Down. I'd bundle them all together to play together. And, uh, you know, they would sell out at wherever, wherever we went. It was a sellout. And eventually... I was I was involved in my my club my which I had bought and Brad was the the waiter, but then you know we got the uh, the Zamba publishing deal took mm -hmm. him into the studios, and Mark was the lead singer that was before Chester, and when I I was their sound man and I would know that Mark was going to lose his voice after the second or third song, pull him down in the mix, so that there would be, people would think oh it's supposed to be low or whatever. So they had a, a showcase, and and guy from Zama, don't worry, I got a sound man, I got a sound man, because I was stuck at my club, at my restaurant. And he brought a new sound guy in who, when Mark started losing his voice, kept pushing him up in the mix. And they said, you know, well, we can't, we can't sign this band. That guy can't sing. And it was just like, oh, disaster, disaster. And then what they did was they got Chester. <clears throat> and I said, I don't think Chester's going to work out. 
and they went on without me. <laughs> wow. Wow. And of course, we know where Chester is now. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, you don't know until you know. Yeah, you know, it's famous afterthoughts, right? Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's in, that's that's in, that's incredible. So, did you um uh, the lead singer from Protege just just died not too a couple days ago. Did you have did you work with those guys at all? Or no, did they no. they come through? I don't re I don't recall them, you know. Sometimes I have to think about some of the acts I booked. Because people yeah. come guy come up to me the other day goes, Hey, remember this guy, uh Ben 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 Alexander? I said, No. He goes, Look at him and he's showing me he goes, he's like all over the place. I said, what, well, what does it mean to me? He goes, he was doing the open mic here like a couple weeks ago. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Uh, that's funny. You know, I same thing. You know, I owned, a, I booked a lot of comedy in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. I booked uh, a lot of shows in Boston. Mm -hmm. I was there for five years. I moved to New York. I opened a comedy club. Had hundreds of guys coming through. Came out here, opened a club on the Queen Mary. Was there for three years. Worked with hundreds of guys. Same thing. I have guys walking up to me being like, hey, you know, thanks for the stage time right? with the Queen right. Mary. And I'm like looking at this dude like, do I know you? It's like, right. yeah, you gave me like all kinds of stage time. And I'm like, all right, man, that's cool. Yeah, it's like, yeah I know. I get guys going to me like, thanks, man. You gave me my first show ever. You know, and I said, oh, really? He goes, yeah, I played bass in like this band I booked 20 years ago. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think I remember you. <laughs> So you're at the Pig and Whistle now doing some stuff, and then you got the uh, the uh, um, uh, the Woodstock reunion thing going. Mm -hmm. um, what else you got going? I know you have your own studio, and you're still producing, you're still yeah, recording, you're still doing some studio stuff. Yeah. What do you What do you got going in your studio? Like what other What other musical things you got going? Well, I've got I'm producing Tony K, the movie director. Mm -hmm. He d uh, directed American History X. He's won Grammys for uh, videos for Bob Dylan. He's been up for Grammys for videos by Red Hot Chili Peppers, Roger Waters, and a whole bunch of other people. Now he wants to become a performer, and I'm producing his album now. Uh, what's, what's the genre? It's more singer-songwriter. Um, you know, I, I arrange bringing different musicians, and we work on the songs, building the songs. It would, it's not pop, it's not folk, it's probably Americana, kind mm -hmm. of, but he's from England, so okay. it's uh, it's different. It's different. I have a few other people that, uh, you know, young guy, Todd Taylor, a uh, uh, local guy, his album is coming out, and, and, you know, I've got Alex Del Zappo from Sweetwater on that, Mike Gurley from Da Da, and uh, Mark Newman, a bunch of really good performers on there. Right on. Yeah, so I'm, I'm working with a lot of new performers, developing them. Uh, Alex sells up actually a solo album for him. We might be we might be doing. Um, I just do that. I, I like getting into the creative part of it and just sitting back. I, I'm getting too old to be out there on the street. I mean, fifty clubs, thirty three thousand performances. Yeah, that's a young man's game, bro. Yeah, I mean, I'm the oldest one that I know that's doing this right mm -hmm. now. I don't know anybody my age that's even close to what I'm doing. That's why I'm down to just a few days at the pig and whistle. It's just like I just don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's a it's a it's a grind, man. It's a lot of work, you know, co yeah. corralling and organizing all the the talent and the personalities and the eagles that come with that, and then yeah. the the management and the venue and staff and all the drama that comes with that, and then you know trying to pull an audience in when you're competing with the epicenter of Hollywood. Man, you got to be a, like a magician. I used to book all the shows at the Roxy and the Whiskey at the same time. And I had three other clubs that I was booking as well. Yeah. So I was responsible that's, for like, you know, 1,500 people scattered throughout L.A. every yeah, night. Yeah, man, that's no joke, man. That's yeah. that's some serious stuff. So um, the softball, the senior softball thing, um, how long you been doing that, and, and how, how did you find that? We, a bunch of musicians... We just got together one day, and we just started playing some softball. And there was this game that would go on every Sunday down in Hollywood. So we would be down there playing, and we said, hey, why don't we form a team? So one of the guys brought me a bunch of information, and I was reading it, and I, said, and I saw the thing 55 and over. Now, I, when I was 55, I called, but it was so vague, and the lady was just like, oh, blah, blah, blah. I said, she didn't take it, it serious. No. A bunch of old dudes out there trying to relive some. Yeah. 
So I never, glory I, never days. I never followed up with it. So now I'm like 65, and uh, so I, I, I guess I've been there two full years or three years, maybe three years. So I called and I said, let me let me see what happens. And she told me about the tryouts or not the tryouts, but the evaluations. Mm -hmm. So I went down and did the evaluations, and I got drafted by Gary Marshall's team. And I went there and I met, they, he wasn't a manager, he was just a pitcher, which is my position. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't going to pitch. Right. You can't, you know, you can't displace sure. Gary Marshall. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I met the manager and, uh, you know, he was pretty rough. He was like, you know, well, what do you do? And I told him, you know, I saw him an infield or a pitcher. He said, all right, go play right field. It's like, you know, uh, uh, at night under the lights. I said, right. I haven't played right, I haven't played the outfield. <laughs> in, you know, Since you were 12. Exactly. <laughs> So he, you know, he stuck me out there, and then we we argued, we argued a lot, and he got he got pissed at me, made me like the substitute catcher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny how some of these guys still have a little bit of ego and a little bit of attitude. It's, a little. That, that it's, it's it's hysterical to right? see as a new guy. I mean, like like you know, last year was my rookie. I'm still kind of on the end of the my rookie year. I'm still kind of like in this winter league. I'm mm -hmm. this is still my first. Winter League, right? Okay. I so know. and um, it's 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 funny. Like in the Culver City on Sunday mornings, I am. Um, oh, I'm this is I'm this is my that. first. This is yeah, dude. Right. You, there's so much fun. Right. The guys are great, and the the level of competition is 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 authentic. Right. It's like, and it's not the. It's not the kind of argue kind of competition. It's kind of the execute. Like people really are trying to right, right. turn double plays Good. and That's my and thing. you know hustle <laughs> and guys are stretching singles into doubles and mm -hmm. doubles mm -hmm. into triples and cool. and trying to score from second on a, yeah. a base hit. Like it's that kind of league. Yeah, you know? I talked to Billy. He said I gotta I gotta send him my email address. He'll send me the application. So yeah, I, I got to do that. Yeah, so, it's yeah. it's it's a lot of fun and and. Uh, I enjoy it, but to sit back and be a fly on the wall. Because when I played, you know, I played semi-pro fast pitch. Right. I played, you know, some baseball when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, I played a lot of softball, every variation of softball you can think of. I won two championships, one in New York and one in San, in San Francisco. When I get down to L.A., it's just like, okay, you know, you're like a squash bucket. Go <laughs> sit over there. <laughs> yeah. And we beat yeah. them. We beat them the other day. Yeah, yeah. We beat him, and he, he yeah. came up to me and said, oh, you know, you've gotten a lot better. I was like, I, I was, <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, the talent has always been here. You yeah. just didn't utilize it. Yeah. That's not, that's on you. Um, but it's a lot of fun, man. I've met I some really, really cool it. dudes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I would love to, like, I launched a, um, see if I can find it here, a web, uh, a Facebook page. Oh, the and San Fernando Valley softball page? Uh, no, it's 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 old dudes playing softball. Oh, that's what you sent me. Yeah. I didn't know what it was. Yeah, and it's pretty cool, man. Let me see if I can if I can find it here. Not I'm just gonna have to search it. Oh, there it is, right in my search. All right, so this Basically, it's uh, let me just move you out of the way. Um, you know, once I met these guys, and 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 I'm always like thinking about, you know, ideas and things I want to do the podcast. And I thought, man, how cool would it be to do? Where like, is this field? This is the Sunday. Oh, this is the Sunday. This one. is Culver City. Yeah. Okay. So there's two fields. This is field two. Is, is that Steve Fisk? That is Steve Fisk. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So. So he's he's pitching, and and this was like I who think, was the guy with the orange shirt? Was that that wasn't Jack? Was it? Uh, no, I'm not no. sure who okay. that cat is. But um, anyway, what I did was I just started taking pictures of these guys, and then Rick the plumber, he's a really good softball player. I think okay. he's rated like uh, a nine or a ten, and uh, so. Factor, you can see that on my shirt. Yeah, like Factors Deli. So we uh -huh. went to Factors Deli to do the podcast, and they're like, "Yeah, you guys should do a softball podcast." So we went there one Sunday after the game, and he and I are chopping it up, and I put that on the site. Oh, cool! And then there's a bunch of like sideline stuff, and I got little quick videos, and I'll go live on my Facebook, and I'll take a bunch of pictures of the guys just doing, 
you know, random yeah. stuff. Well, you brought the yeah. camera out on on a Tuesday or a Friday once, didn't you? Yeah, and I and I I think I filmed one whole game. Wow. Uh, of, of us, which is I think on here somewhere. I'm just trying to find it, but uh, in any event, this is uh, you know, this is something that I thought would be cool to kind of support, you know, what we're doing and. Uh, you know, I'd like to make a serious podcast and I'd like to take all this stuff out there and yeah. just do play by play. Sure. You know, might like pick a game or two right. and just set it all up. I have I have a tent so I can set the tent up behind uh, home plate. Well, you know what you should do? I'll tell you right now. Get in touch with Dave, the commissioner. Mm -hmm. Tell him you want to do it for the all star game or the championship this year. Yeah. That would be good because they have the you know the, you know, right behind home plate. Did they yeah. do it on that field where yeah. they have the electric scoreboard and all that stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll ask them. Yeah, and then we could we could do that. We can uh, totally go live. Yeah, uh, and do play by play. We can set mm -hmm. up a couple different cameras and we get stats on guys. Yep. And I can't I can't do replays though. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not watching now, man. No replay. <laughs> no replay. What kind of setup is this, Kimbro? This is some bull. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's 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 funny. You just never know what rabbit hole that you end up going down. You know, from going out there, throwing it around, chopping it up with the guys on the diamond. Exactly. You know, and uh, well, you know, I, you know, I did. I, I didn't know anybody my age, to be almost honest. I mean. Hardly anybody. Everybody I knew was 20 years, 30 years younger than me. Everybody on that softball team, I said, I was the oldest guy by 25, 30 years at least. So when I joined this league, all of a sudden it's like, hey, these, all these guys are like near my age. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that's what it's like to grow old. <laughs> <laughs> I call them when I tell people, they're like, really? They're like, old dude? I go, imagine the old dudes that are the hecklers on the Muppet show. <laughs> <laughs> all on the diamond field, like trying to throw <laughs> here, and, and then they argue it. It's like it's not really an argument. They all like have their attorneys <laughs> litigate the plays, the calls. <laughs> <laughs> and if any fight breaks out, it's always like an insolent needle against an epipen <laughs> <laughs> showdown. <laughs> but I'm I'm having a blast, man. Yeah, good. You know, it's and it's funny because I also played with the young guys, mm -hmm. and I have the arm and I have the legs mm -hmm. or I have the, the, the bat, bat yeah and uh you know and I have the glove but the second that I started running with this replacement hip that's when I was like the weak link on the team because uh, a lot of guys have trouble yeah. running that's one of the first things they have trouble running. yeah because like the base hits against those guys you know because they have the arms and they can play deep mm -hmm. like if you don't have the wheels to and that's where they got me. Like, right. I had to hit doubles, that, triples, that's, and that's deep what, balls. That's what wins softball games. You don't yeah. have, you have to hit a home run every time up. And uh, you know, if I tried to do a base hit on these guys, they would they would get me every time because I just didn't have the speed. And then, uh. but these guys, it's like you know, between the arms and the legs, mm -hmm. it's like it all cancels out that I don't have the speed because everyone else is as slow as my legs are. Right. Uh, except for some people. I mean, there's still some good ball players out there. Oh, but, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's fun. I think so. I really enjoy it. So we should do uh, we should do some baseball cards for each guys. Oh, that would be cool. Huh? So take a picture, put their stats on, yeah. and then we can like we can post them on here, and gradually like everybody can have like you know you can get old cards. You up. can get old baseball cards, and kind of slide the pictures yeah. in. Yeah, on top of the on top yeah. of until so we'd have the format of the old sure, cards. Yeah, kind of. have the whole classic look. Yeah, exactly. You know, that old Ty Cobb. I'm sure most of them yeah. were <laughs> classic anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, Morty, he actually like hung out with those guys. He's oh, yeah. he's old as time. Yeah, I that know. dude, man. <laughs> eighty, he's over eighty. Yeah. yeah, and he's out there playing, man. It's amazing. He led his team in hitting this year. He's he's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, he's, you know, he's a piece of work. But, he's you know, to see him out there running and throwing and catching, mm -hmm. and, and uh, he's always got something to say, super, just like. We're going to the museum next Wednesday. Do you, do you want to go down? Yeah. Well, like the whole, like the whole league kind of thing? No, like, no, 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 just a bunch of us. Because Morty, you know, it's only by appointment. The guy only opens it up by appointment. Mm -hmm. 
So a bunch of players are going down, and Morty's the guy who knows the owner, so he's setting it up. Oh, yeah, I totally want to go. Yeah, tell him, or I'll tell him. We'll, we'll, we'll carpool down together then. Yeah, no, I'm totally down. I would, right. lo- I would love to do that. Okay, it's yeah. Wednesday. Okay. All right. Um, in the afternoon or in the evening? or Probably late morning. Oh, late morning. Okay, yeah. that's, that's perfect. That's yeah. even better. All right, my man. Well, we've been chopping it up for a while here. Yeah. Uh, where can we find you online? How do we, how do we follow you and your events and your music and your softball? Your my hookup? new website, mikegiangreco.com. And that's yeah. I know it's a work in progress right now. When's your launch date? Well, it's kind of launched. You have a soft <laughs> launch, but you still yeah. okay. We're we're we're, we're, we're all we're a work improving in it all the time. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. But it's got it's got some good stuff on there. You know, it's got uh, when I worked with the, the Unity Foundation with the United Nations Day of Peace, we did uh, uh, Ringo's 75th birthday party. So we've got that on there. Joe Walsh doing his message of peace. When I worked with the Russian American Peace Tour, uh, we did shows in cities all across the country. And I've got uh, uh, Golden Gate Park I was up there with Garcia and Slick and that whole crowd mm-hmm. and and some. Um, songs that I produced that have become videos and some TV shows and stuff that I was on and pictures and a whole bunch of, and we're going to be putting mu- more music on. I got a radio interview I did with Alex Del Zappo from Sweetwater on there and we're updating all the time. So nice. it's pretty interesting. It's fun. Well, Elaine Wiener says hi. Oh, That's hi, nice. Elaine. Uh, Eileen. Eileen. I'm sorry. Eileen Wiener. Weiner. Weiner. Yes. Okay. Have to uh, say it correctly. Yeah. Well, it's good Good to say it correctly because... Huh? And Todd Jameson. Oh, Todd Jameson's there. Yeah. Hey. Does he play softball? I don't know. Ask him. Todd, <laughs> you play softball? What's your thing, bro? Um, I don't know if he's even still on, but anyway, if he is... Let me just see. I, I think I can pull that up. Let me just see if I can work a little magic here and see. Somebody's oh. calling me on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> it always a text. Don't worry about it. <laughs> whoever, whoever called, I'll get to you in a little while. What's that? Uh, Eileen's what? Eileen's a great musician. Yeah. Yeah. All right, my man. Well, All right, we're uh, we're gonna we're gonna go. You can find me um, here. I just uh, I think I'm still going on. Let me just pop myself in here in the background. Um, you can find me podbrother.com, podbrothernation.com. I'm launching a new sports bar promo called a uh, podcast called the Penalty Game, and uh, I dress up dress up in a referee short and in a shirt, and we go out. And hit the sports bars and we just do a bunch of cool bar promotional sports penalty game type stuff and people get a chance to write uh, their penalties on a little penalty card that I make and then uh, if your team gets a penalty you have to act out what's on that card we should play that sometime Mike you know it's mm. it's a lot of fun I was gonna say you know I get these girls to come around to the club with free samples mm-hmm. drink samples yeah we should hook up with them yeah we could play with them yeah yeah so um, anyway, that's how we get down. Uh, thanks a lot for hanging out with uh, myself and Mike. If you guys want to check us out in action on the Diamond, we play uh, every Wednesday and Tuesday uh, at the uh, Balboa Basin. There's four diamonds down there. Come down there, adopt a senior softball player, and then be a booster and cheer for him and bring him cookies and well, stuff. Well, if they want to play Tuesdays and Fridays at Healthy. Oh, yeah, at Healthy, we, we play Tuesdays and Fridays on uh, in the morning. Uh, it's kind of like our practice game. and uh, Free-for-all, and, whoever shows up Yeah, plays. that's kind of like an open, open softball Uh and you know anybody can come and play and, and uh, nine a.m. every Tuesday. And we have and women that come out too. You know? Oh yeah, if you, absolutely. If you're like forty-five years or older, you can play. If you're a woman on the and league, but if you come on Tuesday and Friday, it doesn't matter. How doesn't matter. Are. Okay, so any any age can come out and play on on uh, Tuesdays and Fridays. So, uh, and I also play on Sunday mornings uh, at Culver City, uh, nine and eleven, and uh, we're the red team and we are kick ass. We're awesome. I play third base. Don't watch out. 
Hot box. <laughs> anyway, thanks for tuning in, you guys, and uh, we'll see you on the flip flop. In the meantime, Mike, thanks a lot for coming out. Peace out, baby. And, uh, <laughs> we'll see you on the ball diamond, baby. Right on. Okay. Cool, cool. That it? That's it.